Okay, in this last one hour, we will do a survey of what we have studied and what things lie ahead and then we will close this course. Okay, first I should remove this. Okay, so in quantum field theory, we have seen that the um, objects of interest to answer the questions that we can ask are the Green's functions and we have also been able to put them in the form of Feynman diagrams and we know the rules of calculating Feynman diagrams and you saw that there are diagrams which are containing loops and there are diagrams which do not contain loops. Maybe I'll, I should introduce a terminology. So, there are diagrams which are called tree level tree diagrams. These are the diagrams which do not contain loops and then you have loop diagrams okay, that you have seen already. For example, this is a loop diagram and this is a loop diagram. And formally, we have written down the expressions of these objects. Okay. And um, to do a computation at let us say order lambda square, you would need to calculate this diagram and other diagrams also. And if you try to calculate such diagrams, you will have to do the following. So, let me draw a sample diagram. This is just representing what um, will happen in general. So, I will just make the point based on this diagram. So, here we saw that in addition to these propagators coming from external legs, we had an integral over the loop momentum that flows in here. Let me label the momenta. and this one will be p 1 plus p 2 minus l okay, because this is what you get by using momentum conservation at this vertex. Okay, and this will give you um, integral in the expression which we have seen before it will give you an integral of this form. Okay, apart from other factors and external propagators corresponding to these external lines, you will be required to calculate this integral. Okay, such integrals are called loop integrals. Okay, and if you were looking at a diagram which was two loop diagram, we have seen that that will require doing two integrals. So, it will be some d 4 l 1, d 4 l 2 and a set of propagators over which you will have to do the integral. Okay. So, in principle that is what you have to do and get the answer, but that is where things start becoming complicated, difficult and um, that is also what gives the, the the quantum field theory or its structure because of uh, these higher order uh, higher order uh, calculations which involve such loop integrals. So, let me show you one of the uh, issues here first. So, let us say we want to do this integral and we are interested in um, the, the limit in which the loop momenta L z um, loop momenta L loop momentum L is becoming large. Okay. So, I am interested in L becoming large. You see L goes to infinity right, which we means basically that L 0, L 1, L 2 and L 3 they all become large right, because D 4 L is basically D L 0, D L 1, D L 2, D L 3. Okay. So, we are right now looking at 
what we call as ultraviolet limit. It's called ultraviolet limit because the momentum that is flowing here is very high and high momentum corresponds to uh, ultraviolet limit okay or low frequencies and low frequencies are violet or ultraviolet that's what you say okay so we say we are interested in ultraviolet limit and let's see how things behave in that limit okay i'm not going to calculate this exactly all i'm interested in is the behavior of this object in ultraviolet limit which i have defined like this okay so that's d4l <coughs> which i will okay i can turn to the the following so one can go to euclidean region where um, so right now we have if i write l square that means l0 square minus l vector square but you can change variables and uh, have everything with a plus sign okay i'll go to new set of variables where everything will be like this okay i'm just sketching you can this is not difficult you just have to do small change but anyway so in the euclidean uh, Euclidean space, you, your this uh, integral measure will become d four l e. Okay, so all you have to do is change the the sign, and that's easy. You multiply a factor of i, and that is how you get this. And you will have i over l e square. So I'm saying I'm interested in large l limit. So I can ignore the m square, which is some fixed number, and because l is very large. I can drop m square in comparison to that l square or l e square, and here similarly I can drop what p one and p two are. See p one and p two are fixed; they are provided to you because you took the Fourier transform with some p one and two, uh, p one and p two specified uh, by you, so that there are some fixed quantities. And now l is going very large, so you can drop p one and p two in comparison to l, and it will be of this form. Okay, this factor of i, which we can forget about i, you can put one. Okay, I'm just interested in that limit. I'm not ex evaluating it exactly. <coughs> okay, so that's good. Now this is d4le. So you know that if you were looking at d cube x, okay, you could write it as r square dr d omega. Okay, d omega will be taking care of the angular part of the measure and this is the radial part you okay, can you can also see that dimensionally it's correct because this is three dam three powers of length on the right hand side also you should have three powers of length which is here r square 2 dr1 so that makes three and d omega is anyway dimensionless because that's related to angles okay so similarly when you are look uh, uh, doing a decomposition of d4 le into radial and angular coordinates you will have um, r square sorry r cube dr or let me write as dr r cube so that makes 4 4 powers of <coughs> 4 powers of um, length and then you will have your angular integrals okay and then this one will be 1 over r square 1 over r square okay that's how it will it will go and your integration will be from 0 to infinity okay the radius you will integrate from 0 to infinity okay so let's look at this angular integrals are not going to give you any trouble so uh, as far as u is concerned they they just sit outside don't do much so this one is basically dr and you have r cube and r4 in the denominator so you have 1 over r 0 to infinity okay instead of um, 
putting 0 to infinity and seeing that this is divergent, I will just do one thing. I will say 0 to lambda and then I will take lambda to infinity, which is so all I am saying is I am cutting off the integral at some very high value lambda. Okay, so lambda is some cutoff I introduced and of course I should take lambda to infinity eventually, but for a moment let us keep it like this and this gives you log of lambda. Okay, And I am not interested in the lower limit because this entire expression has been written in, in the limit where L is large. So, lower limit is not something which you should take seriously here. So, let us leave that part out to avoid any confusion okay? because this, this is only true in large L, uh, large L limit. So, you see that if you were to evaluate this integral by putting a cut of lambda, you will get log of lambda and then when you take lambda going to infinity, this diverges. So, we had happily written down expressions of Green's functions okay, to a higher orders in perturbation theory and we were believing that now we will have very precise uh, calculations, um, I mean precise up to the order in which we uh, uh, precise to the level we want because I could go to whatever order in perturbation theory I want and, and write down an expression for Green's function. But now you see that um, this is badly divergent object okay, and it makes no sense to do this integral because it is a divergent integral okay, or more precisely ultraviolet divergent integral. Okay. But fortunately not, uh, it is not a lost game. What um, saves you is uh, procedure which is called renormalization. Actually at one point of time it was believed that because of such divergences, it was believed that quantum field theory is a bad framework and it is one should abandon it okay, because people were getting infinities everywhere. But uh, eventually uh, it was figured out that what one needs to do is something called renormalization. Okay. We will not have time to go into this, but I will maybe I will just say a few words. What it does it, it removes the infinities okay, by hiding them in the fields and the bare parameters that appear in the Lagrangian. So, that m that you saw in the Lagrangian and that lambda that you saw in the Lagrangian and the field phi that you saw in the Lagrangian. These are called bare fields, bare mass parameter and bare couplings and one hides these infinities which you are seeing here in these parameters. There is a well defined procedure for doing that and one gets, gets rid of, uh, gets rid of uh, these uh, infinities and then the entire result is expressed in some in terms of some new fields which are called renormalized fields and renormalized masses and renormalized mass parameter uh, renormalized parameters which are finite and these become singular okay but eventually you get finite results so you have a well defined procedure for getting finite results which you can use to then make a connection with what you see in the experiments. Okay. Then there is a f immediately from this follows the idea of renormalization group and that is quite uh, interesting subject and it has lots of um, um, the high energy physics and um, and condensed matter theory, they have lot of exchanges in this in this particular domain of renormalization group, and uh, field theory is quite used in condensed matter when people are studying things like um, critical exponents and other things. Okay, so this is maybe I can tell one one thing here. For example, when you do 
renormalization group, you start seeing that the couplings that you are seeing, the, the couplings that you have, they change with scale. So they are not constants, but rather they change with scale and that's, that has a very nice and simple and intuitive interpretation if you were to see the same thing in condensed matter systems. Okay, imagine you were looking at some system which has, you know, if, if you are able to look at that system at a very fine scale, okay, at very detailed level, let us say you are able to see the atoms. So, at that level you will be, the, the, the couplings that you will be looking at will be the couplings between those atoms, those interactions between those atoms. Okay. But if you were to look at the same system at a slightly cruder level, rather than looking at atoms, if you could, if you were looking only at the molecular level, then of course the uh, coupling between molecules is different from the coupling between atoms, the strengths are different. And of course, because now you are looking at a different length scale, the couplings will change. Okay. And this is something you also see in the, in, um, in, in this context of quantum field theory. And this is one of the things uh, which I can mention here in about renormalization group. So, it is very nice um, topic and it is fairly uh, well studied subject. So, this is another thing. Okay, so, till now I was mostly concentrating uh, on the UV part, but that is not the only place where things are becoming divergent. There are other places and one such place is the infrared region and where you again get divergences. And by infrared I mean now L going to 0. Okay. So, the components L0, L1, L2 and L3, they all become very small and in that limit again the integrals will diverge. There is one more region where you get divergences and that is what is called collinear, collinear regions or um, Yeah, and you get collinear divergences in uh, those regions and this is typically in massless theories where the momentum running in the loops becomes parallel to uh, external lines and that is those configurations give again a set of divergences just like here you also get here. So, you see you have ultraviolet divergences, infrared divergences and collinear divergences. Okay, and it all seems not so good because it looks like we cannot make progress, but just like we could do something or actually we could get rid of all the divergences which were of ultraviolet type, there is a way to deal with infrared divergences and um, these infrared diverg divergences give a lot of uh, structure to quantum field theories at higher orders and this is a subject of research. Okay. It is not that everything is known about IR divergences, but it is an active area of research, especially in um, quantum gauge field theories. So, you will find a lot of work in QCD, QED and QCD and gravity theories. Okay. And uh, this is an active, active uh, area of research and I will show you how to find some, uh, some material in this direction or any direction. Uh, I will sh show you um, how to do that in a while. Okay. And these infrared divergences are of course, you again get to rid, rid of them and collinear divergences you get to rid of them because unless you do so you cannot make any predictions which you can match against experiments. So, that you have to do anyway, but even from purely field theoretic point of view they are very interesting. One because these are universal. So, no matter which processes you are looking at, they have a universal feature which uh, is same irrespective of what process you are looking at. 
and also um, you have um, you, you can make predictions of certain um, or you can make predictions of singularities of these IR singularities to all orders in perturbation theory. That is another reason why these are objects of such um, interest. Okay. So, in general making any calculation to one loop or two loop or three loop is very difficult. But then here you see that if you are interested in infrared divergences, then you are able to make predictions to all orders, not just one loop, two loop, but to all orders in perturbation theory. Okay. Okay, that's good. Now, um, in this course, we have been to talking mostly of scalars. In fact, we occasionally mention the words spinners and and uh, gauge fields corresponding to, for example, photons and other things. But world is not really made up of scalars. It has photons, as you know. It has fermions like like electrons and and positrons and all other things. So, you would like to um, have a quantum field theory which deals with these um, objects also. So, one first step would be to first try to figure out all kinds of par um, particles or fields that can exist and you can um, find a very good discussion about this which is basically looking at representations. of um, Lorentz group or Poincare group okay. and you will find a very good discussion in Weinberg volume 1 quantum theory of fields or uh, yeah something like that is the title volume 1 and chapter 2. I will strongly encourage you to read that you will find also a good discussion in the book by um, by George Terman. Okay. So, I would um, recommend you to encourage you to look at these. Okay. You will see that naturally they uh, you find that there are spin 1 particles, spin 2 particles, spin half particles and other spin particles. Okay. And the next step is of course, to make a quantum theory of these and first you would like to make a quantum theory of electrodynamics okay which includes fermions and uh, electromagnetic fields quantizing them the best way to do a uh, work with qd is not the way we have been doing what we have been doing is called canonical quantization the best way to work when you have gauge fields in your problem like you have in qed or qcd is to work with what is called path integral quantization or path integral approach. These are much more suited. Okay, and um, eventually you would like to write down a quantum field theory that describes all the interactions that you see around yourself, which includes gravity strong interactions and uh, weak interactions and electromagnetic interactions. Okay. Now, it turns out that you can use quantum field theory and write down a um, meaningful theory or describe these in a consistent, ma consistent manner well defined manner by uh, writing down by by taking the symmetries in addition to Poincare symmetries you look you take SU 3 cross SU 2 cross U 1 symmetry okay, and you construct a quantum field theory and that will provide you um, provide you a theory of strong weak and electromagnetic interactions and this theory is called standard model. 
okay, and it is a very successful um, theory when, which describes all the strong weak and electromagnetic forces within this framework of quantum field theory. And in fact, it is so good that it predicted that there should be a scalar particle which was which has been called Higgs particle. And as you might be aware that uh, we have been searching for long for this particle and we have found it. Note that it was it was a prediction coming out of the theory rather than some input going into the theory. Okay. So, this tells you how um, uh, neatly this, this entire framework has been built so that it required to have such a particle for everything to make sense and in fact it has been found by you know experiments at LHC which is quite an amazing feat. But interestingly and uh, not so nice thing is that the gravity it does not fit in the same framework. Okay. So, this does not allow itself to get no, uh, quantized by the same principles by which we could quantize strong weak and electromagnetic interactions and this remains an open question and among can other candidates string theory is one of the candidates which tries to deal with this and merge them together. Okay, and, um, we will try to look at um, the further development of the subject of quantum field theory in uh, the second part of the course. Now, before I close, I would like to say certain things which uh, usually one would say in a classroom and give some uh, gyan to students, but I am not someone who has a lot of gyan, so I will limit myself to limit myself to a few simple things which I think are most likely correct. So, first thing I would say is that do not trust at all all that I have said in this course. So, let me just emphasize this point do not trust and that is the worst thing that you can do that is to trust. So, statements could have been wrong what I have said, proofs might be incomplete, might be wrong as well, who knows. Okay. So, you have to if you really want to you know, go into research you have to develop your own way of questioning and analyzing and not just believe or trust whatever has been said by me in this course or anyone in any, any course no matter how. Um, uh, a great that person is in the in, in, in research or in teaching. We have to be skeptical of the arguments and that is the only way to make progress. Okay. And you should be questioning a lot. I mean it does not necessarily mean that you start questioning uh, every question you put to the person who is teaching. But you should definitely have lots of questions in your mind and and that can happen only if you do not trust. Okay. So, you should have lots of questions do not do not just try to understand what is being said. Try to also see whether what is being said makes sense. Okay. And of course, it is always not very easy to have questions when things are not so easy. So, if you found asking simple questions even uh, even simple questions if you found them I mean if you found it difficult that you know you come up with simple questions in this course it was mostly because it was first round when then you go to the next round meaning you read or look at the lectures again I am sure you will start having more questions because you already have some some experience some some um, uh, some things with you and then asking becomes easier. Okay. But questioning or having questions is only a necessary thing.
it is only a necessary condition for learning and not sufficient. Okay, we should be able to also able to find answer to our questions okay. and one way to do it is have simple questions you create questions yourself. So, so there can be two kinds of questions you do not understand something that is why you have a question or you understand something very well and now you are trying to phrase a small question around it. What if I do this what happens then this is another variety of question one question is one variety of question is uh, how have you done this part or how does it follow okay, that is one trying to understand what is being said other variety is you understand something and now you take that something from the film familiar context into slightly different context or maybe a small extension. Okay, one example could be we looked at SU3 you say okay, that is something I have understood I know how many generators there are these things and that things. Now you say okay, I, let me look at SU5 how many generators there are what will be there um, you know how they would look like. Once you start asking such simple questions soon you will be asking much nicer and much better questions. So, that is one thing I would definitely encourage. So, uh, learn to make exercises for yourselves. Okay, it is not always a lot of fun to solve exercises created by others they are important you should do them. But then it is a lot of fun if you are able to create exercises on your own because then that really means that you have understanding of something and then your exercise is going to take you beyond what you already know okay, because it is coming out of you. So, that is something um, we should try and whenever you do such a simple thing each such small step each such simple exercise that you create that will lead to big jumps in your understanding. Okay. I would definitely encourage you to try this. Now, I will before I uh, stop let me show you two websites where you can uh, find the research that is happening especially in, um, in high energy physics and of course other fields as well. I am hoping that screen is still captured. So, here is one. So, this is called archive archive.org. So, here is the, the, the address. So, you can see that every day notifications are uh, or the papers are uploaded here. So, for example, let me take you to this one phenomenology HEP phenomenology or HEP theory. So, these are or HEP experiment HEP lattice. So, these are the ones which are related to energy physics. So, let me take you to one of these. So, this is a new listing. So, all the papers which have been newly put here they are here. Okay. So, you can find the latest research here. So, these are not published ones already these are preprints. Okay. So, before people publish their work they first put it in the archive. So, that others can see and comment and they can get feedback before they submit to a journal. So, this is a very good resource if you want to see what is happening in research this is how you try to um, stay updated. Then the other source which is very useful is inspire and I have here um, done a search for the works by Ashok Sen. Okay, so, you see F stands for a find E A I, I do not know exact author Sen Ashok. So, that is I think it one can do more simply these days, but I am doing it old style. So, anyway so, if you are trying to search for papers by Ashok Sen or by anyone you go here you type this or maybe just type Ashok Sen probably that will also work and you will find all the papers that he has recently written. 
okay for anyone okay so you can also search for um, papers here and most of the things are are available here so these are some two very important resources and of course if you are um, someone who is interested in let's say condensed matter i think i'm not sure let's check mm, yeah i do see something here so condensed matter for example and astrophysics and uh, yeah, all other things are also here so these are two very useful resources and you can try to see um, papers in here to get an idea of uh, where things are what things are happening and where things are going and what might be of interest to you for your research okay um, i think that's all i wanted to say so i will thank you for attending the course and say bye